not every program on television is captioned, but the National Captioning Institute is currently captioning 24 hours of programming each week for the deaf and hearing impaired. And more is coming. The captioning process begins when the broadcaster sends to NCI a cassette copy of a program prior to its being broadcast. The transcript of the program is edited into captions which fit the scene. You forgot to count the students. On the console, we can enter captions and see how they would appear over the video, and all of those captions are stored in the console's computer memory. You forgot to count the students. We use caption placement to indicate to a deaf viewer who's speaking. The broadcaster transmits the captions as electronic data. They're not seen at home unless someone has an adapter unit on their television set, and then the captions become visible. It's the same reason you don't fall out of a roller coaster when it goes upside down. If you're going fast enough in a circle, you stay in your seat, just like the water stays in this can. So would that mean that gravity... Well, the caption TV opens the door for the hard of hearing and hearing impaired person. Now they can watch television like anyone else and enjoy all the motion pictures and television programming. Uh, all three stations, NBC, ABC, and CBS, do have in prime time caption television, okay? And uh, this enables the hard of hearing to watch television once again. How did Sears get involved with the closed caption television? Oh, about three years ago, Sears and the government had decided that there must be something to help the hard of hearing watch television. Sears came up with a patent and went to the government and got a patent for the hard of hearing caption television. It's only available through Sears, and it is a Sears patent. The Sears and Lions Club are putting on a demonstration of caption television. Also, uh, Miss Debbie Bryan, I believe her name is. No, Debbie Herb, I'm sorry, will be here with some of her folks from the uh, Hearing Institute to show caption television to the public. What's been the response so far? Very good. The uh, response has been very good through the catalog on the top model I showed you earlier, and now the response to the caption TV already built in has not started to roll yet. How did the Lions Club get involved with this? Well, Lions Club has always been involved with the hard of hearing and the hard of and the sight pro program, and together they have uh, gotten together and decided to do a program for Sears in getting the word out to the hard of hearing. The recent earthquakes in Italy have aroused local concern for surviving disaster victims. Reverend Emerson Tiller, pastor of Christ Community Church in Crown Point, is conducting an Italian disaster relief fund to offer aid to victims. Well, for the last two weeks we've been seeing this situation on TV. And over the weekend I happened to pick up a newspaper. And on the front page they had a picture of a little girl, she looked to be eight or nine years old, standing on a street corner and she had two or three bags around her feet. And the caption under it said, this is all that's left of a family. I think at that point, it really hit me, the disastrous situation that the people were in. Moved by what he'd seen, Reverend Tiller decided to start the Earthquake Relief Fund through the Bank of Indiana. All donations can be sent directly to the bank. And any branch will accept the funds and will give people who bring a gift a receipt so that they have a record of what they've given. Is there a contact person at the bank? Uh, no, anyone at the bank, any teller, knows what we're doing. So anyone who comes in should simply say, I'd like to make a donation to the Italian Earthquake Relief Fund, and they will automatically know where the funds go. A post office box in Crown Point is also available for people who can't reach a bank. It's box 714, where people cannot get to the bank, could send their money there, and the monies will be uh, forward from that point right into the bank account. And uh, where will the funds go from there? Okay, the funds will, from that point, be transferred to the consulate in Detroit, the Italian consulate, and then they will see that it's directly applied to the relief of the people caught in the earthquake. Kathy Talanko, Channel 50 News. <laughs> The purpose of the luncheon today is to commemorate the Pearl Harbor uh, invasion in 1941, and this is a 14th annual uh, luncheon commemoration ceremony. 
and uh, this year we're fortunate to have as our main speaker uh, Anson Simnack, who is the first uh, female graduate of Annapolis. Well, what I'd like to do is just give people an idea of, of what it was like for me, why I decided to go to the Naval Academy, and the, some of the experiences that I had there, um, as well as what my motivation is to be in the Navy, to have chosen the surface Navy, and maybe reflect on a few of the issues that are important to women today as far as um, the combat issue, um, ERA, and the future of women in the United States um, in the Navy as well as in other occupations that have been traditionally male. Here in Oklahoma City is a company that is in the business of making mud. For it turns out, it takes mud to drill an oil well. And the rush is on to drill more wells and find more oil and gas here at home. The company, aptly enough, is called Drilling Mud Incorporated, a subsidiary of W.R. Grayson Company. Drilling mud is a very special kind of mud, which is carefully formulated from such things as bentonitic clay, sophisticated chemicals, barite, and in some cases, even pecan hulls. And what does drilling mud do? Pump down a pipe that is drilling for oil. The mud lubricates the bit. Forced back to the surface, it carries with it bits of rock that are cut away and plasters the wall of the hole, keeping it from collapsing. And one thing more, sometimes high pressure gas is encountered while drilling, gas which could blow out the well. The latest from Grace is liquid, pre-mixed, emergency mud, which weighs twice as much as water heavy enough to contain the gas pressure. Drilling Mud Incorporated has 34 plants in nine states, all supplying mud. Well, the, at the time, within a week, I sold about 400 copies of the Elvis, and I intend on, I would say, four or 500 of the Lennon. He's got a stronger following, I would say, in the rock business. Okay. Ken, um, this morning when you opened your shop, were there any um, unusual sales this morning with the John Lennon records? Uh, it seems like I had about three or four customers right off the bat that wanted the new John Lennon album. We had a real rush on it. Well, I anticipating selling his section out over there and trying to reorder it, which would be pretty hard because the rest of the record stores in the Chicagoland area will have uh, the same problem. Which is what? Trying to fill orders that people want now that he's gone. Oh, they were shocked. A couple of them were in tears. Yeah, before you got here. A couple of them were. They just really loved the Beatles. With Christmas just around the corner, looking for gifts for the youngsters of all ages on your Christmas list can get very difficult. There are always old standards like bikes and trains and planes and all sorts of toys. But this year, the emphasis, well, it seems to be on electronic games. There has never been such a selection of electronic games, from ones that test your skill to ones that talk back. Christmas, 
For Channel 50 News, I'm Rex Havlin. Well, this is a, an historic uh, day for Gary, I think, and uh, really for cities all over this country because we will be signing today an agreement called a negotiated investment strategy. And basically what that means is that the federal government, the state government, and the local government, that is the city, has sat around a table uh, over a period of months and negotiated with each other uh, regarding uh, planned development for the city of Gary. What have you earmarked the money for? Well, uh, there are a number of uh, projects that are involved that range all the way from the uh, completion of the uh, Gary Genesis Center uh, to the uh, development and construction of a small boat harbor in the city of Gary, uh, the construction of 400 units of uh, private housing uh, come to mind, the, the uh, construction of a major uh, downtown enclosed uh, shopping mall. Uh, there are just a number of projects uh, that range uh, from uh, housing uh, uh, development uh, to health development. Toys for Tots is a program that the Marine Corps Reserve has been engaged in for a number of years. And what it is, is every year the Marine Corps Reserve asks those in the community who may have uh, the funds or the resources to either purchase new toys or donate good used toys to the Marine Corps Reserve Toys for Tots program. We in turn will take these toys and give them to organizations like the Salvation Army, SEDA, uh, Metro Corps, and things like that, who will give them to the less needy. So what's the bottom line of your push to get more people to donate used toys? Well, the bottom line is we have as many or more requests for toys. The need is still there this year. And we're trying to appeal to the public uh, to let them know that we're still here and we're still very interested in helping out the less fortunate. And we wish that they would join in with us and, and help us and make it a merrier Christmas for a lot of children. Too many misconceptions are known about alcoholism. We call it the social stigma of alcoholism. Uh, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about alcoholism. Uh, and we try to make that the focus of our community education seminars as much as possible so that we can break the denial of alcoholism in the individual and in society. Yep. Most of the people that we have coming into our alcoholism community education seminars are the family members themselves of the patients uh, we, uh, or the friends. And we encourage everybody to come into it. Um, you were right. And that's the, one of the myths about alcoholism is that uh, one of the things is, is you're not an alcoholic unless you drink every day, you're on skid row, you're falling off the bar stools all the time, and this is not the alcoholic. Uh, only 3% of the alcoholics in the country end up on skid row. <laughs> If you haven't quite decided, here's an array of hints for that special someone. But if you're still looking for a gift that will be talked about for months after you take down the Christmas tree, here are some of the more common pets. Probably parakeets, canaries, finches, and hermit crabs. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, th those are the very common items. They're a less expensive item, and uh, it's a good item to start. Any of those items are good to start with, with children, you know, maybe 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. And it, because they do make good pets, the parakeets, for example, can learn to talk. Uh, they can be tamed, and it's a good responsibility for a child. Uh, also in the small animals, guinea pigs and hamsters, things like that. Anything that's relatively inexpensive, somewhere in the 10 to $20 range. How are the frogs selling this year? Frogs, uh, that, that's an exotic animal, I guess, too. You have to like frogs or aquatic animals, and uh, uh, th there's kind of specialty items, so only certain people would buy those. It wouldn't, it's not really a common item at all. But the one gift to give your boss is one never to be forgotten. So if you want to get back to your boss, you buy him a tarantula? I wouldn't recommend it, but <laughs> it's possible. Um, what do tarantulas eat? Uh, they eat live animals, uh, crickets, um, mealworms, things like that. Primarily crickets, that's what we feed or ours. anything they want? <laughs> or anything they want. It has to be live, it has to be moving. Uh, they eat baby mice, baby rats, things like that. The more exotic, the more you'll pay, with cockatoos costing around $1,000 to nearly $5,000. Woo. This is Susan Taggart, Channel 50 News. Bye-bye. 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 Following four years of negotiation, Congress finally approved all but two provisions designed to improve 488 acres of lakefront near Beverly Shores and Gary. The original amendment, costing $35 million, called for a homeowner's package for those living along Beverly Shores and improvements with Porter County's grain belt. But despite the rejection of those two provisions, First District Congressman Adam Benjamin Jr. says he's happy with the bill. Included is the completion of Highway 51 to the lakefront in Gary, improvements of two natural wetlands, additional access provisions to the beachfront, and improved transportation from urban areas. And finally, the development of a new park and boat harbor in the Gary area, all at a cost of $3.1 million. The mysterious disease called glaucoma is as common as diabetes, with three out of every 100 Americans afflicted each year, and yet physicians have no idea what causes it. Glaucoma is a silent killer of sight, afflicting every age bracket and sometimes taking up to 10 years to rob an individual's sight. It increases the pressure behind the eye because of the increased, uh, the fluid stops draining off, so the pressure increases. Um, as a result of that, the nerves behind the eye start to become damaged. The, uh, the side vision is slowly lost then, but it's so, it's so gradual that usually people do not realize that they do have a problem. The symptoms of glaucoma vary, but what is predictable, if left untreated, sight will slowly diminish until it's too late. Uh, possibly halos around lights or severe pain. Um, but in most cases, there's not really any symptoms. That's why it's a good idea to have their eyes checked every two years so they catch it before it does any real damage. In many cases, blindness is preventable, and the Indiana Society to Prevent Blindness today conducted free glaucoma screening tests in East Chicago. Here, we check their vision, and then we use the non-contact tonometer, which is the machine that's, that's used to measure the pressure in your eye. Uh, nothing touches the eye but a puff of air. It does not hurt, but it's normal to uh, jump a little bit when the air comes out. Okay. The telltale signs of a family on vacation make this home an easy mark for even an inexperienced burglar. In only a few days, mail and newspapers have piled up. The drapes are tightly drawn. The thief knows he has plenty of time to ransack the home and steal the most valuable possessions. A few precautions can make a big difference in the safety of your home. Make a checklist of things to do before leaving town, which will create the impression that you're still home. Stop all newspaper deliveries. Have the post office hold your mail. Put timers on some lights and possibly on a radio. We asked James McGrath, Vice President of Corporate Security for American Express, for some tips on protecting your valuables against theft. One thing is to do is travel light. By that I mean only carry with you those charge cards you're going to use on your trip. Leave the other ones at home. Unfortunately, at times, luggage is either stolen or lost. So always keep your traveler's checks, your charge cards, or even cash certainly with you rather than checking them in your luggage. 
There are simple things you can do to protect those valuables you take along. Certainly you shouldn't leave in a hotel room your passport, your airline tickets, traveler's checks, or other valuables. You should either carry them with you or use the safe deposit facility that a hotel will provide you. Also, make sure when you do leave your room that you always close the door and that it's securely locked. Crowded shopping areas pose a different threat. What seems like a jostle from the crowd can actually be the quick movements of a pickpocket. Keep cash or traveler's checks in an inside pocket or in a purse fastened inside your clothing. I recommend when people travel that they carry traveler's checks. If they have money or other valuables with them and they're lost or stolen, they can't be replaced. But traveler's checks can, usually within the same day. To ensure a quick refund, you should keep those traveler's check numbers separate from your traveler's checks when you travel. Whether you're going to New York, San Francisco, London, or a mountain lodge 100 miles from home, a few precautions can make all the difference. This is Lee Thomas reporting. decision that is going to be made, uh, uh, whether it's made today or at a later date, regarding his ability to be seated uh, at the, uh, state in the state legislature is up to the members of that commission and the uh, uh, members of the House, I understand. They will make that decision. I don't, I, I'm neither a member of the commission nor am I a member of the uh, House of Representatives, so I, there's nothing that I can do in that situation. I, as I said, hope that he will be seated, but I realize that, that I uh, certainly have nothing to do with the process. having this serious problem? Because there's no regimented or legal way for uh, those wastes to be s disposed of, and they've been improperly dumped, and now the, resi the, the residue is seeping into our groundwater. Is toxic supply. waste chemicals something new, Mr. Horn? No. They've been generated for decades. Mr. Horn, assuming that they're doing that in Chicago, in the metropolitan area, and he says they have to find someplace else to go. Fine. They start dumping in Whiting, in Hammond, in East Chicago, and Gary along the lake. Aren't we just shifting that pollution and that toxic waste into other areas? No, because the dump sites will now be licensed, and uh, the containment of the wastes will be supervised. So the burden isn't being passed on. It's going to be illuminated, brought uh, before the eyes of enforcement agencies to make sure that what dumping is done is dump done properly. Vacations. For many, they're the time to let go, to spend hard-earned savings. But an alarmingly high number of travelers find their trips spoiled by theft. Just last year, American Express alone refunded more than $40 million in lost or stolen traveler's checks. We asked their vice president of corporate security, James McGrath, what travelers should do if they've been victims of theft. Well, certainly they shouldn't panic. They really should just call the police. They should report it to the hotel if they're staying in a hotel. And if the police make a report, which they probably will do, they should get a copy of that, which can be used, say, for insurance purposes. It certainly can be used to replace a passport, and it can be uh, used for other purposes as far as replacing traveler's checks or cards if you knew those numbers. May I have the traveler's check numbers that you're missing? Okay, how would you like to have this refund? Would you like it in Rochester? We have an office there. Let me check that for you. Hold this on, This refund please. center, operated by American Express, gets nearly 2,000 calls a day from stranded travelers. Hopefully you were carrying traveler's check and charge cards and not cash, because if you were carrying traveler's checks and cards, 
you can usually get those replaced. For example, if you had an American Express card that was lost or stolen, you could call us and we would be able to replace that generally within the same day. Because airline tickets are negotiable, like cash, replacing them may be a bit more difficult. In most cases, you'll have to buy new tickets and file for a refund, which may take several weeks. An airline ticket, like any other form of value, is something that a thief or someone who found it in the street could use. So if you have lost your airline ticket, you should report it to the airline as soon as possible. And certainly you're going to want a refund for that airline ticket. If you have charged that airline ticket, it's going to be easier because you can use that receipt to prove your purchase. Take precautions to prevent losses, but be prepared if they happen. Then the loss can be put down as a minor inconvenience, not a major disaster. This is Lee Thomas reporting. The 100 kids are taken to a local store, and each is given about $15 to spend on Christmas gifts for moms, dads, sisters, brothers, and friends. We work actually about uh, two weeks in advance preparing the items for the uh, uh, per uh, kids to purchase. Uh, it's something that we all think is a lot of fun, and the kids really enjoy it, so we, we appreciate the whole, whole effort. The kids are real excited, as always, and uh, they enjoy Santa, and they enjoy the shopping spree. It's a toss-up as to who gets a bigger kick out of the project. The kids or the JCs who organize the event act as chaperones and assist with gift wrapping. When the kids are done shopping, any money they have left over, they keep for themselves. And uh, I was chaperoning two little boys last year. And on the way back on the bus, I had a little guy sitting on either side of me. And uh, they were sitting there counting their money. And one of the little guys had about uh, 14 cents, and the other guy had 78 cents. And they, they were asking each other how much they had. And of course, they were all excited. Well, a couple minutes later, I felt a little tug on my uh, arm, and the boy's, boy with 78 cents says, say, Mr. Bach, how much money will I have to give him so that we'll both have the same amount? So he split his money up, and, and they both went home with the same amount of money. And that, you know, when you're working with kids, you sometimes wonder if the project you're doing is getting through to them. The policy that the city developed for the area uh, was, uh, went beyond the question of essential services and uh, what the defendant is contending, of course, is that we did not, in fact, Pro, uh, provide all the things contained in that policy. And what we're saying is that we provided essential services, but we could not provide everything that was contained in that policy because of the failure of the state tax board to uh, allow us to use our resources to do so. Within the last generation, Americans have experienced a prime interest rate which has bounced from 1.5% in 1940 to 7.5% in 1970 to the present of 21.5%. With the surging cost of buying money, economists are saying businesses are now caught between increasing cost and slowing sales, and now everybody is scrambling for money, even the smallest of businesses, which means inflation is digging even deeper. In Congress, in the federal government, will not cut spending, which is fiscal policy, that, that we've got no help there uh, in fighting inflation. So the Federal Reserve has to do it alone with monetary policy. And they're the money supply. Everybody's watching the money supply for you. So as they are now, it looks like they really are cutting down the money supply. Therefore, the banks uh, or the banking system, the money uh, isn't there. You, you get close to a credit squeeze on on the money supply. Therefore, the crowding out occurs when who is going to get the money are your better quality people only, like the General Motors. And it, if it gets bad enough, there's only going to be one person in there, and that's the federal government, because they must have theirs to fund their debt, 
and they pump the money in just enough that their uh, auctions will always come off. But. With prime interest rates hitting an all-time high, well, there's even worse news to hit the economy, something called stagflation. Uh, the problem that we had a preview for uh, this spring was there's nothing normal anymore, and we're going to have stagflation again. And that's a very dangerous two-edged sword in that even though recession comes, and in the past the rates have gone down a lot, now with the inflation built in not only to the to the debt that's outstanding, but in people's expectational, it, it, the rates don't go down that much. They ratchet higher in each period like this, and so you get stagflation, uh, stagnant economy and inflation still going on. So Economists can't agree or even predict how high the prime interest rate will go, but one thing is for sure, the wintry chills of inflation and the continued recession will be with us through 1981. <laughs> Uh, there are orphans and there are churches that have needs and why we would always have to give our money to the uh, Navajo Indians in New Mexico or something I'm not I'm not sure now I'm not opposed to those and as long as they're ethical and as long as they're legal then that's fine uh, I would say this for a beginner it would be very helpful obviously if you knew the people and if you knew where the money was going to begin with now, number two, if you don't know, then you better find out. And the only way, Susan, that I really know that you can find out about a charity, uh, whether you're in northwest Indiana or you're in Chicago or Milwaukee or Detroit or wherever you might be, is you pick the phone up and free of charge, you get a background report from your Better Business Bureau. <laughs> For Donna Coppolero of Dyer, the town's decision to raise sewer user rates by as much as 100% was a complete surprise to her and for many homeowners living in Dyer. What Dyer is faced with is an alien sewer system that isn't meeting federal and state environmental protection agency standards. And unless the town improves the existing system with a new sewer separation facility, the state says it will curtail any further residential growth in Dyer. What Mrs. Coppolello can't understand is why no one told anyone of a sudden increase in rates. Uh, the first article that I seen was in last Tuesday Sun Journal stating that uh, there is going to be a meeting on December 23rd and this will be on the agenda. The town denies its part in notifying homeowners, saying there were a number of public hearings late in 1979 on proposals to raise the rates by 50 percent in January of this year to meet inflationary costs, with the expectation of another increase in 1981 to cover the 15 percent needed to cover its share of the $9 million project. Town board members could be faced with a fight at its next town board meeting when homeowners come armed with petitions protesting the increase started these petitions. I started them Friday. They ran for three days and as of Sunday night I do have 1,000 signatures. Mm -hmm. So it does show people here in Dyer are against this increase of the rates. They are all against it. They all tell me that they feel that their water bills are high enough now. And even one woman told me that she does have her house up for sale due to this reason. Thank you. 
Every year it's the same story. And according to the Better Business Bureau, it's usually the mail shopper who procrastinates until December 24th to do his Christmas shopping. So for all of you who haven't started fending off the crowds, the Better Business Bureau has these few tips. Don't do it first. Secondly, if you're going to buy something, then buy something if it's Christmas Eve from a place that you do know, that you do know that they're going to be relatively receptive. If you walk back in that door two or three days later and it's not functioning, that they're going to be relatively friendly to you. Buy the kinds of products that you're familiar with, that perhaps you've already read some newspaper ads and you know something about prices and, uh, and maybe something that you know how it works because if you get it home and it doesn't work right um, because you've gone out and bought something brand new and weird, maybe you could have done much better down the street. Thinking about going to an exotic place like Chicago to buy that new fangled widget board or an expensive European touring bike, you might consider this. Oh, I have nothing against the people in Chicago or any other city. The problem gets to be, first of all, if you're buying something, Susan, uh, and you live in Sherville, or you live in Couts, or you live in Gary, and you go into Chicago to buy something, you get it home, it lands under the Christmas tree, uh, it's opened up on Christmas morning, and the bicycle is missing the handlebars. Now, you may well have to pack the entire thing up again and cart it all the way back to the loop to see if you can get yourself a set of handlebars. That's one, and that's a little cumbersome, and it's time consuming. Uh, number two, a lot of the shops, uh, particularly in the loop area, they will open up small little shops for the Christmas season only. So once you get the bicycle back there without the handlebars, you may find the place is closed up. Now that sounds funny, but it isn't funny if you're toting the bicycle and standing there and you're facing a closed door. Now obviously if you're dealing with a major well-known uh, established organization in Chicago, that's fine. But you still have n not only maybe to take the merchandise back there in that time, but you have the problem of communicating with them. That's a long-distance telephone call. It's just easier if the two of us look at each other eye to eye and talk things over than it is if we talk on the phone or we do something through the mail or mail order. Well, the anonymous phone calls uh, that we've tried to locate uh, and talk to, the people will not give us their names. Uh, we feel that it could be a, a ploy on the union-busting law firm that the company has hired to, to try and start uh, that information. When the company released that press information, the employees are feeling that they do not know what's going on. And I think that uh, nobody can make a fair evaluation of the issues at hand until they have the facts from both sides. From the Gulf of Mexico to the Rocky Mountains, from Pennsylvania to California, the stepped-up search is on for oil and gas. Well over 60,000 oil and gas wells will be drilled this year, more than the previous record set in 1956. But only one out of 50 wells will produce any significant quantities of oil and gas. Sam Riley is an exploration superintendent for Mobile Oil. We believe the greatest potential lies in the more frontier areas such as the deeper water offshore or um, the Arctic areas to the north such as Alaska, offshore California, what have you. The old onshore areas like South Texas still offer tremendous potential, but the easy oil has been found there. What's left is a, is a bigger risk, a bigger gamble today. So the cost is not only higher, but the risk is higher as well. Over one-third more wells will be drilled this year than last. Competition is stiff for leases, drilling rigs, and service crews. But since the gradual decontrol of crude oil prices, the odds are better for gambling on the search for oil and gas. And the payoff in greater energy supplies could be higher. To drill for oil and gas is no different than drilling for water or anything else. You put a bit on the end of a long string of pipe and drill it into the ground to make a hole that may go down 1,000 feet to 25,000 feet. Once you've completed the depth, you, you run a string of steel pipe in it to protect it and complete it into a producing well. Production is what you're after. 
If you achieve that, you know the gamble has paid off. More than 3,000 rigs a week are operating this year all over the country because small independent oil men and major oil companies are gambling on energy to cut down our dependence on imported oil. Tomorrow, a day in the life of an oil man. This is Marvin Scott reporting. Now that the word is out for the designer of the Eagle T-shirt, seen recently worn by some of the American hostages in Iran, it's been anything but quiet around the Dr. Robert Angerman house these days. Dr. Angerman and his family have been inundated with calls and letters requesting the Eagle T-shirt. Within the last 48 hours, the Angerman family have received 15 calls an hour from all over the country, all over a T-shirt idea that was just a hobby. Well, I'm kind of patriotic and... Uh... I'm also a stamp collector, and uh, one of the things that I, one of my favorite stamps has that eagle's head on it, and uh, as I looked at it one day, I, it looked like a mountaintop to me, and um, I sat down in literally a couple of minutes and just sketched the word America under it, and it looked like a mountain with a, with a snow, snow top on it, and um, I did a poster, and a friend of mine saw it and said, boy, that would really make a neat t-shirt. Well, sometime in February when we received a letter. Uh, from three of the hostages stating that they had received a letter or had received the um, t-shirts uh, and then we saw pictures in April or a picture of one of them wearing them um, and really nothing happened since then other than a few letters from the hostages and some phone calls from their families and we've sent shirts to their families and uh, and then all of a sudden in the last five days uh, we've seen them all over TV so Dr. Angerman says it's been an emotionally uplifting experience to see patriotism still alive and well. And the nicest thing about the shirt is that it seems to have transcended all age groups and, and social and economic barriers because we've had calls from literally all the states in the union. Um, we've had people buy the shirts of all age groups and um, from all ethnic uh, areas, and that's the nice thing about it. Sam Riley is superintendent of exploration for Mobile Oil Corporation, where he's a geologist. It's his job to interpret geologic and seismic data collected by geophysical equipment by bouncing sound waves through the ground, a kind of sonar. The data is analyzed by computer, and then Sam Riley will decide whether or not to drill a wildcat well. Anytime you drill an exploration well, that's a real gamble. You're putting a lot of your money up front with very little certainty that you're going to find a commercial well. In the overall sense, if you took the United States as a whole today, only about one out of every ten exploration wells results in any kind of a producer. So, truly, exploration in an overall sense is quite a gamble. Experts estimate that the U.S. has proved reserves of 33 billion barrels of oil left. Despite that, right now, about 40% of the oil we use is imported. In the near term, in the next 10 years, we're going to have to depend upon plain old conventional oil and gas, plus our, our nuclear and coal production capability to meet the bulk of our energy. In the longer term, those sources, plus our synthetic fuels, and in the far term, solar power will come into this. We cannot accomplish any of these goals unless government takes its rightful role in energy development, and that is not in the marketplace. Experts say the U.S. still has much more oil and gas to be found. 
but it will just cost more to recover. Energy will continue to grow more expensive. Dr. Larry Ruff of Brookhaven National Laboratory feels we must learn to adjust to higher energy costs. One of the most useful ways to adjust to higher energy costs is to use less of it, to find ways of doing what we do uh, using less energy, using more plentiful forms of energy, uh, and, uh, and to do those things which are called energy conservation. Oil production in the U.S. has been dropping by more than 3% each year. But by the year 2000, energy consumption will be up 20%. Even if more oil and gas is found, alternative energy sources will have to make a bigger contribution to fill the gap. Energy conservation will significantly reduce the energy needs below what they were thought to have been before. We will still produce about the same amount of oil and gas that we do now, roughly. Uh, nuclear power should be able to play a, uh, a, a larger role if the problems of public acceptance and safety and so on can be solved. Coal, no doubt coal production will increase uh, quite a bit, both for direct use and for conversion into liquid and gaseous fuels that we use in our automobiles and homes and so on. Finding and developing enough energy resources to see this country through the next 20 years is the gamble. Conservation, oil and gas supplemented by nuclear power and coal are the cards we must play if gambling on energy is to be a good bet. This is Marvin Scott reporting. Each year, thousands of Americans suffer heart attacks because they're out working in cold weather. Well, here are a few helpful hints to try to avoid any dangers in your winter work. According to the Physician and Sports Medicine magazine, elderly persons or people with hypertension or those with a history of or a high risk for heart disease should not shovel snow. Secondly, Older people, particularly those more than 40 years of age, should pace themselves with an interval or a work-rest approach. Oxygen consumption and heart rate are lower during intermittent exercise than with continuous exercise at the same workload. Sudden strenuous exertion may result in excessive strain on the heart. Warm up by beginning exercises or work gradually. It may even be desirable to warm up indoors in some instances. Lift small loads rather than large, heavy loads. Use a short shovel with a small scoop. Wear a cold weather mask or scarf to avoid inhaling cold air or exposing the face and neck to that cold air. Avoid large meals, coffee, or other beverages such as tea or colas before or after shoveling. Don't use alcohol or tobacco before or after shoveling. Avoid overdressing for exercise in the cold. 
Snow shoveling or any other vigorous activity increases the body temperature. Now, dressing too warmly causes an abnormally elevated body temperature and a greater strain on the cardiovascular system. So as winter continues to dump more of the white stuff on us, we urge everyone to be careful when they're out shoveling snow and make sure you know what you're doing and doing it the right way so that you don't have any serious problems this winter. For Channel 50 News, I'm Rex Havland. Keeping in line with the 1977 federal legislation, more of us in all money brackets will see higher deductions than last year. That includes those taxpayers in the $10,000 bracket who haven't seen a tax increase since 1979. Everyone who works and is covered in Social Security is affected. Uh, for the average, I think we mentioned before, the $10,000 figure, that person will pay more into Social Security about $1 a week. In 1980, if you made $10,000, you would have paid $613 into Social Security. In 1981, that figure would be $665. If the person made uh, uh, the maximum in 1981, $29,700, that would be increased uh, to uh, $1,975. According to the Social Security Administration, the increase has come at a time when high unemployment has depleted resources and the system was barely meeting its obligations in retirement benefits. When people aren't working, they're not paying into the system. Uh, the labor force in this country is over 100 million people. 1% would be over a million people not paying into the system. And when I did my math the other night, if the uh, average person made uh, 14, 15,000, that would be a thousand dollars per person. So that's a billion dollars a year, one percent uh, unemployment would create a, a deficit of that. Well, we were, uh, we sent an invitation to Washington, an application for an invitation to Washington about uh, oh, three, four weeks ago and told them that we'd like to be in the parade. And they called me back and said, yes, we had a big chance of being in the parade and, and we had a chance of leading the parade. And then when they realized that we were police officers carrying firearms, they put us out of the parade. And the word came secondhand to me from Pasadena that you better get in touch with the people in, in Washington because you're out of the parade. And so we, I called them and told them we'd forget about the firearms. We're talking with Mr. Jack Weinberg, spokespo spokesperson for Bailey Alliance. Mr. Weinberg, there is an important meeting going on right now in Washington, D.C. That's right. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is meeting today. Uh, it has on its agenda uh, the question of whether to issue a show cause order to NIPSCO. Um, this has never been done before. The effect, uh, if the show cause order were to be issued, is it would require NIPSCO to prove to the Commission that it's safe to build a nuclear power plant at its current site with a heavy population. Um, this has never been done before. In fact, it's never even been considered before. It would be a very important move if this would happen. Um, we don't yet know if it's going to uh, actually be ruled on today, and we don't yet know what the outcome. However, uh, at least two members of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, two of the commissioners, have flown over the Bailey site and have looked at it. The whole, the whole question of building a nuclear power plant in such a populated area is getting very close scrutiny right now in Washington. There are, congr there are congressional committees that are investigating it. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is also investigating it, and 
they've basically decided they will never again build a power plant nuclear plant in such a populated area you know they're deciding whether or not bailey should be the last one built you are the spokesperson for bailey alliance that's right we like to thank you thank you for coming in and explaining to us hopefully we'll get some information before okay. the night is over i'm bob freeland that's the inside report This action taken by the Republicans uh, in the legislature is unfair uh, and not based upon uh, any uh, tangible evidence, that is evidence that would stand up uh, in court. Taylor did out campaign his Republican opponent, Roland Lewis, by a margin of 12,000 votes to Lewis's 1,300 votes in the November 4th runoff. And Hatcher says Taylor is still the declared winner in his mind and says yesterday's decision will probably open a series of legal questions. Um, I think there are a number of legal questions involved here uh, that uh, I would uh, take issue uh, with the uh, actions. Uh, particularly of the House Committee uh, that, you know, made the recommendation initially. But uh, those matters, I believe, ought to be resolved and ought to be settled in a court of law. The purpose of a bond is to make sure that the individual appears for court. It is not supposed to be a punishment because they are, under our law, innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. Yet you're asking a person to, to fork over 500 bucks to a bondsman when he hasn't been proven guilty yet, when in fact he may be innocent, and that $500 to get out of jail, he never sees if he does what he's supposed to and that's appear. Mm -hmm. And that is the biggest or largest criticism of the bonding system uh, today. We had found two holes, one hole on the first floor and a hole on the second. And by following these holes up, there was a knob and tube wiring. It, and we had found where it had been exposed. Then it had followed, oh, about four inches. You can see where it burnt downward in, into the outside wall. This is between your studying and wall and traveled on up into the attic area and then spread to the rest of the building. Officials say crews were dispatched only after a police car spotted the fire and radioed into police headquarters, and that at no time did anyone actually report the blaze to the East Chicago Fire Department. I think we're safely uh, say we can add that there was no calls come in on a fire at this address. No one called in. No one had no called one. in. Even afterwards, even That's after right. the blaze. Why? Why did they make a call? Everybody. It, it seems that. Joe did it, but Joe never did it. They're thinking that somebody else had reported, so uh, they won't go ahead and, and uh, follow up on it. 